Good evening, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath to those who still have the Sabbath going on. For some people, the Sabbath has come to an end. Either way, happy Sabbath. Today, we have a guest with us today. This is Sister Inga. 
and um, she's going to be speaking about the. I hope I don't butcher this for the social. Can you can you say what you're going to be speaking about today? Yes. Hello. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> yes. Thanks for having me. No um, we're going to we're going to be discussing today about dress, uh, the physiology of dress, which includes the health implica implications, spiritual um, and physical. And so, um, yeah, that's what we're going to be talking about. My name is Inga. Um, I'm from originally from St. Lucia and currently living in New York. Um, I'm doing ministry with my my husband's family, um, a lifestyle center in upstate New York. And um, I have a background in like fashion and modeling. And ever since I became a Christian, I decided to use all of my talents to glorify God. And one of those talents is sewing, making clothing. And I had always been interested in fashion. So I used that energy towards starting a modest clothing line and also speaking about modesty on my YouTube channel, Instagram. Praise God, praise God. Uh, first and foremost, obviously, before we get into sharing this information, we want to invite the Holy Spirit. So if we could just bow our heads and we'll pray and then Sister Inga can begin. Dear kind and righteous Father, Lord, as we come together, on this blessed holy day, Lord, we thank you and give you thanks and praise for allowing us to have another day to be here. I pray and invite the Holy Spirit, Lord. I, I pray that you use your holy vessel to bestow knowledge and wisdom upon those who are not aware of, of the topic which we are going to go over today. We thank you and we ask all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You have the floor. Yes. Hello again, everyone. Hello. <laughs> yes, I'm happy to be there. We're going to have a very interesting discussion today. And I know that modesty is a hot topic. Um, it's one of those things that's kind of difficult to talk about sometimes because of all of the things that um, we go through as fellow humans <laughs> on planet Earth <laughs> um, regarding dress. And, you know, just, you know, so many, there's so many factors, you know, in in uh, the outside world, outside of church, and also in church, um, all of the things that come about in that, you know, dress is just one of those things that nobody really wants to get involved in because it's it's just hard, especially um, if you don't tr really understand it. And then also the things that people say to you and so on, it, it just kind of shies people away from the topic. But I'm gonna let you know today, I wasn't always a modest dresser. <laughs> And I wasn't always a Christian. So for me, um, I hope that I can come on, on common ground with people and with all of you and that I can bring a little bit more understanding into why I dress modest and um, why it's important to do that, especially as a Christian who loves and serves God. Um, I think we. we I became moved. a Christian uh, I think, in 2014. I think we kind of losing you there. You freezing up a little bit. Let us. And you know, as it's you know a custom for um, for you to dress modest in church. You come to to God. You dress appropriately. Um, but there was always some little voice in my head just saying, but what about every other day of the week? <laughs> Why is it that, you know, we dress modest to come to church, but yet we still go to the beach and wear bikinis. We still um, go out to the mall in shorts. You know, we wear skinny jeans and we just dress differently. But then when we come to God, you know, we're, we have a, a different attire. So that question was always in my mind. Um, but I did play it safe as, you know, that's the best place to be is on the safe side. <laughs> um, but as I became more um, involved in church and started studying more and finally um, started asking questions about modesty and why we should dress a certain way. And I started really studying it because I, I felt that I needed to know even before I started studying into it, I, 
started dressing differently just on my own. I just felt more comfortable in more modest clothing as I drew closer to God. And I just wanted to dress more, you know, not showing off as much. And so little by little, things started to change without me even studying deeply into it. But just that getting closer to God started to change me as well. But today um, I'm going to talk about dress, the physiology of dress and why it's important even for our health to dress modestly and um, the spiritual reasons and, you know, why as Christians we need to, you know, stand up and uh, appropriately every day because we are giving ourselves to God a living sacrifice. And um, then we can get into it. Dear God, I thank you for blessing us with your word. Thank you for all of your loving care and kindness towards us. And thank you, Lord, for just giving us insights and knowledge into every aspect of our lives, dear God. We know that we are supposed to be changing from victory to victory. And I ask that even as we study your words today, that they will take lodgment into our hearts and we may understand the steps that you want us to take in our lives and strengthen us and help us to overcome self and to do right by you in every corner of our life. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So as you can see, the title says dress to kill. (laughs) And we have a list here um, of Things that can happen to our bodies like shortness of breath, headaches, nosebleeds, fullness about the chest, producing palpitations about the heart, irritation of breathlessness, nerves and veins become contracted, bad circulation that produces disease, double labor upon the heart, weakened heart, inflammation and congestion of the lungs and brain, constant cold, catarrh, swelling in the face and neck, cancer, miscarriages and premature death. Did you know that the way that we dress can contribute to these very things? So in Genesis 1, verse 26, it says, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And so as we look at that passage, we were created in God's image. So if we are created in God's image, then we mirror what God looks like. And so we can ask ourselves, what is God clothed with? If God has a covering, then that must mean that we have had a covering as well. So we can look back in the Bible in Psalms 104 verse 2. It says, Who covers thyself with light, as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. So you can see here, this is talking about God here. He covers himself with light. So God is covered in light. And in Genesis 2, Verse 25, it says that Adam and Eve, they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. So Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, and they were naked. They weren't ashamed. And you know, oops, it says in Christ's um, Christ objective, a beautiful soft light the light of God, and shrouded the holy pair. This robe of light was a symbol of their spiritual garments of heavenly innocence. Had they remained true to God, it would have ever have continued to enshroud them. But when sin entered, they severed their connection with God and that light that held, that had encircled them, departed. So this is a little more information as to what happened when Adam and Eve sinned and why they now saw themselves as naked in the garden. Also, um, 
in the previous text, this word naked is translated to mean that they were not clothed with the same type of garment that we wear today, like regular clothing. Um, but it doesn't indicate that they had nothing on whatsoever. So what happened to their clothing after sin? In Genesis 3 verse 7, the eyes of them were both opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So keep this in mind that they sewed fig leaves together and made aprons. So apron is an important word. Naked and ashamed, they tried to supply the place of heavenly garments by sewing together fig leaves for coverings. So apron, a shagor, girdle, belt, loin covering, or loin cloth. So this is the original translation, and this is what it means. So it's something that just covers just a very small amount of their body, just the private areas. <laughs> it might probably look like this today. A very small apron just to cover, cover the loins. So what did God do as a result of Adam and Eve recognizing that they were naked? Now, you know, when also when in the Garden of Eden, after Adam and Eve sinned, and God came to Adam, and he said, where art thou? Adam said, I ran and I hid myself because I was naked. But notice that he had already sewn fig leaves together um, as a garment. So if he had already covered himself, why did he still see himself as naked when God called him? So in Genesis 3, 21, unto, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. But they were already clothed. They already made fig leaves and sewed it together to cover themselves. Weren't they already clothed? So God make coats of skin and clothe them because he realized that what they had made was not sufficient in one way or the other. So what is a coat? A coat, the coat that God supplied Adam and Eve is translated from the original word kethanek and um, it's from an unused root meaning to cover a garment or a robe and this is so different from an apron. So a Hebrew correlate of the previous two words refers to protective coverings, arms, and robes. Did the Lord God make coats of skin? So we see an apron is a girdle, a belt, or a loin covering, and a coat is a garment or a robe. So we then have to ask ourselves, why did God feel the need to change what Adam and Eve had already sewn together. And you see that we always try to make our own way and fix our own issues when God already has the answer for us. So he saw that their garment wasn't sufficient. It was a, just a little apron. And now sin had come into the world and the climate has changed. Things have changed. We don't, we, we now have different seasons and we now have that wonderful atmosphere in the beginning was no longer because sin had come into the world. So how was the climate affected after sin? It says in, in humility and inexpressible sadness, Adam and Eve left the lonely garden wherein they had been so happy until they disobeyed the command of God. The atmosphere was changed. It was no longer unvarying as before the transgression. God clothed them with coats of skin to protect them from the sense of chilliness and then of heat to which they were exposed. So now they had extreme hot and extreme cold weather. So a little apron is not going to protect them from the cold or from the beating sun. So God knew what was coming and he Created, he created a garment that was going to be thick enough. It was a coat of skin. It was going to protect them from the sun. So it was going to cover most of their body. And it was going to keep them warm when it's cold. It also says in Patriarchs and Prophets that the atmosphere, once so mild and uniform, 
in temperature was now subject to marked changes, and the Lord mercifully provided them with a garment of skin as a protection from the extremes of hot and cold. So there are reasons for reform in dress. So God reformed Adam and Eve's dress to what they created for themselves and provided them something better. So there is spiritual moral, which is the modesty aspect of the garment. And there's the health and there's also distinction between the man's garment and the woman's garment. And we'll see those things as we go further. So right now we'll discuss the health implications. So what is the purpose for clothing? Okay, my PowerPoint is stuck. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so how was the virtuous woman clothed in Proverbs 31, verse 21? It says, she is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. So here's a small example of one of the reasons that one of the, the things that um was brought out is that she's not afraid of the snow because all of her household is clothed in scarlet so they're clothed appropriately for the weather and they're not afraid of what's coming so what is scarlet so as we look in the margin um, in our bar bibles if you have one and see the word scarlet is noted to mean a double garment so that means that it has double layers so it's sufficient to keep the cold out and to keep your body warm knowledge must be gained in regard to how we eat drink and dress so as to preserve health and perfect health depends upon perfect circulation On councils, on in councils on health, from the pen of inspiration, it is it says it's impossible to have health when the extremities, hands, arms, feet, and legs are habitually cold. For if there is too little blood in them, there will be too much in other portions of the body. And this is something that's written 150 years ago, but today we can see that there are serious side effects to the way that we dress, especially if it's an extreme hot or extreme cold, um, the circulation of the blood is not properly flowing through the body. And we'll see why that is as we go on. So the blood in our body supplies oxygen, water, nutrients, it eliminates waste and frees the body from poison. That's the function of our blood. So the blood contains several types of cells. We have red blood cells. Um, they're red in color and they carry the nutrients and oxygen to every tissue and fiber of your body. It also takes away carbon dioxide and other waste products. Thus, it nourishes and cleanses. White blood cells, these are colorless micro dots. They protect the body against toxins, disease, um, toxins, disease organs, and various irritants. They attack and destroy disease wherever it may be found throughout the body. So let's take a look at our anatomy. We also have different types of veins that carry that blood. We have arteries, and these are the vessels that keep the blood from, that take the blood from the heart, and they carry the warmest blood to all the parts of our body. So that includes the extremities, which are our arms and legs. They tend to be high pressure vessels and they have to contain more pressure and are actually built different. They have a muscle in the wall that can open and close to allow blood to flow. They also cause 
a shunting effect, meaning that one vessel can shut off and let the other places get the blood for a while and they can go back and forth and alternate. They also tend to run deep in the tissue. If you have ever had an arterial blood sample drawn, they take it from the deeper vessel than a usual blood sample. If you cut yourself seriously and you see blood squirting out under pressure, you know you cut an artery and not a vein there. And veins, these are the vessels that return the blood to the heart. They are low pressure and they tend to run surface. When you look at your arm and put um, a tourniquet on your arm um, to take your blood pressure, like a blood pressure cuff, you see these vessels start to bulge out. These are veins and they run on the surface. They tend to surround tissue like the arms and they tend to make a better so that arteries don't constrict interior wise. So all these things are going on in our body and this is just the blood vessels. So this is like a little picture of what it looks like, um, the veins and the, and the arteries and what the walls of them look like and the valves and so on. So they go back and forth and the blood is pumped in different directions to keep that flow throughout the entire body. So what type of blood vessels are in our extremities? In the extremities, when you find large vessels, you should expect increased function, meaning a muscle can lift weights because of the blood supply through it. Or you should expect increased warmth is needed in the extremities to flow through. So why do we lose elasticity? Why do we get more stiff as we get older? Why do those joints act up on us? The types of vessels in the extremities, uh, the limbs and feet have large veins to receive large amounts of blood. Um, warmth, nutrients, elasticity, and strength may be imparted to them. But when the blood is chilled from these extremities, their blood vessels contract, which makes the circulation of the necessary amount of blood in them still more difficult. A good circulation pressure preserves the blood pure and secures health. A bad circulation leaves the blood to become impure and induces congestion of the brain and lungs and causes disease of the head and heart, the liver and the lungs. This is from the health reformer, also written as you can see, 1868. <laughs> so this is a long time ago, but we do have scientific backing for these things as well. And we know that, you know, all the technology, technology that we have um, through medicine and um, studies of our bodies, how the blood works and how the blood flows throughout the body. Um, this here is a wound from bad circulation. So because of these tight socks um, that were being worn, this is also probably something like a uh, diabetic wound. Um, people with diabetes um, end up having these type of sores and bad circulation and swelling in their feet and um the tight things socks and you know they also have like different types of things that they wear to uh compress uh the foot so that um they don't swell up with fluid and so on uh, this is causing you can see the that it looks like she's wearing a sock <laughs> so the circulation in her foot was just not good. And that's why these um, uh, wounds actually appear here because of bad circulation. So we can see that something, you know, as simple as this, <laughs> once you cut off circulation of blood to your, to anywhere, like it starts to die. That part of your body will start to die if there's no blood flow to it. So who formed our limbs? Our creator has formed limbs with large veins and vessels to contain a large portion of blood, that the limbs may be sufficiently nourished and properly warm with other portions of the body. But fashion robs the limbs of coverings and life current is chilled from the natural channel and thrown back upon its internal organs. This is the health reformer as well. So let's take a look at how God works and what our part is. 
The vessels of our arms and legs are arranged for our protection. God designed that we run our arteries in places that are protected. Your major arteries don't run close to your elbow. They run on the other on the inside of your arm. Notice your arteries don't run over your kneecap. They run on the back of your leg. Why did God do this? He knew that we were going to bump ourselves up a fair amount. God handles the, anat the anatomy properly. He takes care of the vessels and he's given us wisdom on how to keep our bodies in shape as well. So God has done his part. The question is, are we willing to do our part? God has made the vessels large. He has protected them from trauma. So what is our part in this situation? How do we maintain proper circulation? Do you know what your part is? So proper clothing. How the dress reform regulates every article of dress worn upon the person. In order to equalize the circulation of the blood, the clothing should be equally distributed upon the person. The equal warmth may be preserved in all parts of the body. So if all of your body is, is warm, then your blood is going to circulate properly. If parts are cold, you know that the blood is going to slow down in that area. And so what does equal portion you know that Satan is is also a fact and seeks to distort the image of God and destroy our bodies. <clears throat> Sister Inga, I don't know if you can hear me. It appears, uh, it looks like we just... We just lost you. You kind of, yeah, your connection was going in and out. So if you could just try that again and just share your screen. There we go. Are we there? Yeah, there you go. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. So women's diseases. Uh, women have a lot of um, different uh, issues uh, that come about. And some of those issues can be helped or prevented um, just by having proper circulation. Uh, says here, much of the feebleness which is suffered by women is the result of improper clothing of the extremities. Congestion of the pelvic organs can lead to cerv cervicitis, dysmenorrhea, cervical polyps, and malposition of the uterus. During pregnancy, the placenta may not get a sufficient circulation of blood, as a result of a sluggish exchange of blood. The development of the fetus may be retarded. Vitality is expended unnecessarily to support heat that is lost with insufficient clothing. Usually proper dress also de demands warm uh, underclothing, absorptive cotton for underclothing, not synthetic fabric, are often required to meet all the various needs of the body. So if you can imagine, if you're having some of your limbs are not getting sufficient circulation and um, some parts of your body are chilled, the blood is like not flowing where it's supposed to be flowing. So, um, or you get a congestion of blood in one area that's kept warm and the rest is chilled. So it chills back the blood and that all that warm blood stays in one specific area. And so that congestion can cause all kinds of inflammation and um, later on disease. So as we think about covering our limbs and <laughs> thinking about the summer and how it's hot and we don't want to wear long sleeves or, you know, cover our bodies up as much um, and in fear of feeling too hot, um, why do we actually feel hot? So we feel hot because our core temperature rises. So the core temperature is the temperature of the internal organs. 
the central part of the body. The core temperature is hot because the core temperature rises when we have poor circulation to the extremities. And so that sends a signal to the brain that says, okay, we're overheating, so we need to cool down. <laughs> and um, when in actuality, the circulation just needs to be regulated. So what should you do if you want to cool off? So the Arabs who live in the hottest country in the world, <laughs> how do they dress? How do they keep themselves cool um, in 113 degrees Fahrenheit desert weather? In the summer, the weather in Dubai is very hot and humid. The temperatures reach 45 Celsius or 113 degrees Fahrenheit for many days at a time. Even the sea temperature reaches 37 Celsius, which is 99 degrees Fahrenheit. With humidity averaging over 90%, the highest recorded temperatures in Dubai is 126 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is how they dress. <laughs> so you can see that the material is very loose. It covers his entire body so that the sun doesn't beat down on the skin and make him feel overheated. Um, it's also white, which reflects the sun. So you can see that in the hottest country in the world, uh, this man is completely covered up um, from head to toe to and you know, surviving. <laughs> But I can't imagine going out in a desert like this with no shade or anything with, you know, my skin being exposed to the sun. That would be terrible. <laughs> and <laughs> this is just a little bit of a joke. And there's some Arab women looking at an American girl walking by <laughs> and they're covered from hand to toe and she has like hardly any clothes on. <laughs> um, so summer needed from the sun to allow precipitation um, to cool down, uh, to cool the body and protect from the heat. Winter cover is needed to insulate from wind's chill and retain heat close to the body. So dress is very important. So how do we keep cool? So we dress against the heat. Protect the skin from direct rays of the sun with loose cotton clothing that fully covers the arms, the legs. In countries where the weather is very hot, clothing is loose fitting and covers the body well. Also, dressing for the climate and circulation is important. So good conductors, good conductor, Poor conductors, on the other hand, retain heat as previously mentioned and are proper for cold weather. So some of the well-known materials in each category that are natural fiber materials are good conductors, which are good for hot climate is cotton and linen and poor conductors, which are good for colder climate are silk and wool. So with silk, it's got the knit is very tight and so it keeps the wind from coming through and wool is very thick and warm but cotton and linen have a looser knit and they're lighter materials so they let air flow come through and then they can also shield you from the sun at the same time so our fabric is important and our dress is important as well Many have done themselves untold injury by compressing the waist. So this is about those waist trainers and corsets. <laughs> when, when the waist is compressed, the circulation of the blood is impaired and the internal organs cramped and crowded out of place, cannot perform their work properly. It's impossible under such circumstances to take a full inspiration. Thus, the pernicious habit of breathing only with the upper part of the lungs is formed. The clothing of most women is worn too tight for the proper action of the vital organs. Every article of dress upon the person should be worn so loose that in raising the arms, the clothing will be correspondingly lifted. So those tight clothing that constrict your blood flow 
are not helping your organs out. <laughs> so we can see here, these are like some of the corsets that they used to wear back in the day. A lot of people still wear, wear them today. Um, but they completely change your organs. You can see here that the ribs are just squished and all the organs are pushed down into the belly. <laughs> And so just to get that tiny waist, the organs are all misplaced. <laughs> um, there's actually a lady that has her, um, she had an x-ray done and it shows this pretty much this exact same thing. And she wears a corset 24 seven and she has like the tiniest waist in the world. And all her organs are just, she looks like she could break in half if <laughs> if she doesn't wear that, that corset to support her, but um, you know, her doctors say she's okay, but um, I can only imagine, you know, the, the kind of maybe digestion, digestive problems and things that she might be experiencing. So a woman's dress should be arranged so loosely upon the person about the waist that she can breathe without the least obstruction. Her arms should be left perfectly free and she may, that she may raise them above her head with ease. The compression of the waist by tight lacing or tight skirts, pants, shirts prevent the waist matter from being thrown off through its natural channels. The most important of these is the lungs. If the lungs are cramped, they cannot develop, but their capacity will be diminished, making it impossible to take a sufficient inspiration of air. The compression of the waist weakens the muscles of the respiratory organs. It hinders the process of digestion. The heart, liver, lungs, spleen, and stomach are crowded into a small compass, not allowing room for the healthful action of these organs. So once we start constricting blood flow and oxygen from our bodies, how is the blood supposed to carry that oxygen throughout all of our systems and to all of our organs? It's going to be held back from doing its job. So here's another tight article of clothing <laughs> that has become so popular. So tight it hurts skinny jeans. Um, this is a little video here. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to hear it. Um, I'll just play it. Um, but it talks about skinny jeans on a news report. This is, <laughs> this is not a Christian station. This is just news. <laughs> um. I would, if you could, because we can't hear the audio, I would okay. just hit the share button at the the very bottom. Once you hit the share button, it sh you should see check to share sound. Okay. Uh, um, let's see. If you close, close your share, like close your share. Oh, close, stop sharing the screen? Yeah, stop sharing. And then when you hit share again, you should see at okay. the very bottom, it should say share sound in the corner. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes, I got it. Great. Okay, here we go. So we should be able to hear it now. NBC4 News at 5 starts now. Are you willing to pay a high price for fashion? We're not talking about dollars and cents here and the impact on your wallet, but actually the potential risk to your health. NBC4's Lolita Lopez with the story. It's been said that fashion fades, only style remains. But those different styles could cause you pain that is truly eternal. If you're doing it day in and day out, and you're uh, exposing your body to uh, undue stresses, your body is going to respond, and it's not favorable. Dr. Ferdad so, uh, Mobin is a neurosurgeon associated with St. Vincent's Medical Center. He is seeing more and more patients with problems connected to the clothes and shoes they wear. Uh, L5 and S1, which is the last disc in the lumbar spine. has ruptured there's the businessman with fainting spells the culprit his button downs and ties we came to the conclusion that he should wear very loose fitting shirts miriam and heaven took a more casual approach to their wardrobe today but not often even though it hurts you wear your heels yes i do wear my heels most of the time well here's something that may make you think twice ladies that wear it a long time they can have a short achilles tendon and uh, they can have uh, stress factors in their ankle. Maybe we should invest in really short espadrilles or something. 
Skinny jeans can cause shooting pains down the legs and thighs, leading to nerve damage. A belt too tight may compress soft tissue in the area. Those tummy reducers can lead to digestive issues. With all these don'ts, we might end up looking like this guy. But don't panic. Simple isometric exercises, no gym necessary, can help avoid long-term problems. You need to dedicate anywhere from nine or six to ten minutes a day. If you put your hand underneath the desk mm -hmm. and then just try to lift the desk up, and you can see how it's activating your pain. Ultimately, Dr. Mobin recommends not wearing the same clothes or shoes all the time. So Remember to mix it up. I'm Lolita Lopez, NBC4 News. talking about skinny jeans and just tight clothes in general, how it can affect the body, the muscle tissue, um, and you know, blood flow and cause health problems and digestive issues. So this is also an article here, um, a news report. It says, uh, I, I think this is just part of the same thing. Oops. Right. So it says, this thing is in my way. Uh, it says, if you wear body shapers, remember they're made for smoothing, not squeezing you down to size. And if they're worn too tight, for too long, some shapers can also prevent the lungs from fully inflating, reducing oxygen intake, making you feel lightheaded. Men aren't immune from health-related problems associated with tight clothes. Tight and that look put together, but about seven out of ten men buy shirts that are too small, according to the Cornell University study. You have your corroded vessels going up to the brain. And so sometimes people can have some restriction in blood flow and that can cause headaches and blurred vision. Tight shirt collars and ties can also increase muscle tension and in the back and shoulders. There is no need to cause yourself injury just to be fashionable. Wow. <laughs> So tight jeans can also can cause nerve compression and digestive issues. Body shapers can reduce lung capacity, leading to lightheadedness. Tight shirt collars, neckties can reduce circulation to the brain and lead to muscle tension in the back and shoulders. Tight boxer briefs reduce sperm production. High heels, sky high. Ankles, bunions, flip flops, shoes without Arc support can lead to long-term ankle and foot problems. Heavy handbags can cause back pain and tight advanced details braids can lead to headaches. So says a team of British orthopedic specialists. Experts say wearing high heels for a long period of time can lead to hip knee pressure, muscle damage, and back pain. It's also reported it, caused, it causes leg and feet swelling, varicose veins from dilated blood vessels, and can stress a woman's reproductive system by affecting fertility. Could you imagine that high heels can affect your fertility? That's just... It's crazy to think about, but this is what people are realizing more and more um, as we look into our bodies and, you know, as science gets more developed and we study how the body works and how these fashions are affecting us. Um, here's another video for us to watch about heels. I love their high heels. Heels, no matter the pain or the price, but we're told high heels may increase the risk of a woman of having serious health problems because of them. KGK's Teresa Sardina has more on the beauty and the beast of wearing high heels. They don't fit, so help me a little wear them anyway. No matter what, women will wear high heels. A study by the Journal of Applied Physiology shows women who wear high heels can cause permanent damage to their feet as soon as they reach their middle 20s. Podiatrist Matthew Kendall says over time it causes your Achilles tendon to contract, and he sees women come in with the after effects. Which can include uh, bunions, uh, hammer toes, 
uh, corns on their feet, uh, pain under the, uh, the metatarsal heads, which is on the, the ball of the foot. We're told wearing high heels for a long period of time can lead to hip, knee pressure, muscle damage, and back pain. The problem is when you wear high heels, it tilts your pelvis forward and makes this arch a little more aggressive. Chiropractor David Flynn of Tyler tells KETK it's adding pressure and pain to the joints. If your heels are up in that position, a lot of the muscles get tight and respond to you being at that elevated posture the whole time. It's also reported it causes leg and feet swelling, varicose veins from dilated blood vessels, and can stress the woman's reproductive system by affecting fertility. Kendall suggests women wear a heel no higher than two inches if they'll be on their feet for hours. If they're wearing a very high heel every day um, and there's just no getting around it, what they need to do is make sure that, it, that that shoe is a good fit. By making a fashion change, it can prevent long-term health problems. I love my high heels and I'm still going to wear them no matter what. Teresa Sardina, KETK News. So there we see the ladies don't want to give up their heels. I know they look cute, but they're causing big problems big big problems so I love their high heels so millions suffer from corns calluses bunions hammer toe blisters ingrown toenails or just plain aching feet because they want to wear those cute pumps <laughs> so when shopping for clothing these are the standards which the clothing or fabric if one is sewing should meet good quality durability suited for service warm protective covering the limbs suitable and becoming colors not expensive and the appropriate length so god really cares about us he cares about our dress as well and uh, we have to do our part to make sure that we dress in a way that is practical that looks nice as well and that is going to keep us healthy and strong for more years of service. So the three reasons for reform, again, spiritual, the health, and the distinction between male and female dress. So now we'll look at some of the spiritual um, implications of our dress. So how we dress is a silent creature. The dress and its arrangement on a person is generally found to be the index of a man or a woman. We judge of a person's character by the style of dress. One who is simple and unpretending is in her dress and in her manner shows that she understands that a true woman is characterized by her moral worth. And this is in child age. When you look at this guy, what do you see? Who are you seeing right here? It's a, he's a doctor, right? You can see that he's a doctor by the way that he's dressed. So he's dressing for his job. And who is this man here? We have a policeman. When you see him, you know you're looking at a policeman. And when we see this guy, who do we think this guy is? <laughs> a rapper. And um, you can see that by the way that he's dressed. So our dress and in society is not something that's just, you know, just anything that you want. We dress according to who we are. And we judge people according to how they're dressed every single day, whether we like it or not. So how are we dressing and what message are we sending by the way that we dress? In the book Education, it says, Chase, simplicity and dress, when united with modesty of demeanor, will go far towards surrounding a young woman with that atmosphere of sacred reserve which will be to her a shield from a thousand perils. And I find this passage to be so interesting because even in the world, um, like I'm in some groups, my husband's also in some groups of women um, 
that dress modestly. And there's lots of women in those groups that are, they are atheists, they don't believe in God or they're non-religious. And they dress modestly just simply because they want to avoid all of the other things, you know, that come with dressing immodestly. And it's true that how you dress can either can create an atmosphere and it's either going to create a sacred atmosphere or it's going to create a distracting one. So this is Muhammad Ali and he had a story to tell that was very interesting. He said the following incident took place when Muhammad Ali's daughter arrived at his home wearing clothes that were not modest. Here is a story as told by one of his daughters. When we finally arrived, the chauffeur escorted my younger sister, Layla, and me up to my father's suite. As usual, he was holding, he was hiding behind the door waiting to scare us. We exchanged many hugs and kisses as we could possibly give in one day. My father took a good look at us when he sat me down on his lap and said something that I will never forget. He looked me straight in the eye and said, Hannah, everything that God made valuable in the world is covered and hard to get. Where do you find diamonds? Deep down in the ground, covered and protected. Where do you find pearls? Deep down at the bottom of the ocean, covered up and protected in a beautiful shell. Where do you find gold way down in the mine, covered over with layers and layers of rock? You're going to work hard to get to them. He looked at me with serious eyes. Your body is sacred. You're far more precious than diamonds and pearls and you should be covered too. Well, this is a true story, Muhammad Ali <laughs> and his daughters. And he, he spoke to his daughter and told her straight up, if diamonds and pearls are hard to get to and they're valuable, you're far more valuable than those things. And you should be hard to get also. <laughs> so in these last days, fashions are shameful and immodest. They were brought in by a class over whom by a class over whom Satan has entire control. So this is Mary Quant. She was one of the designers who took credit for the mini skirt and hot pants. And by promoting these and other fun fashions, she encouraged young people to dress to please themselves and to treat fashion as a game. She said, a sexual creature, she displays her sexuality instead of this coy business of hiding it. Today, she dresses to say, I am sexy, I like men, I enjoy life. Many, cl many clothes are symbolic of those girls who want to seduce a man. So this is not by accident. Many skirts didn't just come about just because it's easier. It came about because there's an agenda behind it. When asked what mini skirts will lead to, she replied with one word, sex. So this is not an accident. <laughs> a person's character is judged by his style of dress. And you can see it right here, blatant and obvious. <laughs> so should we dress like the world? We can see in our world today that the trend of modesty, even, you know, so many years ago, it wasn't, it wasn't like this. And we're not trending towards modesty, we're trending away from it. And so there's different styles, obviously, that come about and there's different, um, you know, people come up with different styles as we as we move, move through life and society changes. But we can see that we're just going more and more towards immodest dressing in the fashion world. So Christians should not take pains to make themselves a gazing stock by dressing differently from the world. Meaning we don't have to dress oddly or dress like we don't fit in uh, to the world. Uh, the Bible says um, we're to be 
in the world, but not of the world. <laughs> and as humans, you know, there's nothing wrong with, you know, being up to date in your attire and fashion. Um, but if when following out their convictions of duty in respect to dressing modestly and healthfully, they find themselves out of fashion, they should not change their dress in order to be like the world. But they should manifest a noble independence and moral courage to be right, if all the world differ from them. So we're not trying to look odd, but if in dressing modestly, we end up looking a little odd, it's better to do, it's better to dress modestly than to dress like the world immodestly. If the world, if the world introduce a modest, convenient and helpful mode of dress, which is in accordance with the Bible, it will not change our relation to God or to the world to adopt such a style of dress. Christians should follow Christ and make their dress conform to God's word. They should shun extremes. They should humbly pursue a straightforward course, irrespective of applause or of censure, and should cling to the right because of its own merits. And this is found also in child guidance. So the final point out of the three is a plain distinction God designed that there should be a plain distinction between the dress of men and women and has considered the matter of sufficient importance to give explicit direction in regard to it. For the same dress worn by both sexes would cause confusion and great increase of crime. And as we can see today, <laughs> this is really interesting because we see this playing out in our society today. We see how the, the gender lines are being blurred especially in fashion, you know, men and women dress the same. Sometimes you can see somebody walking down the street. You can't tell if it's a man or a woman you're looking at from behind. <laughs> and it says right here, it can, it causes confusion and great increase of crime. Wow. That was heavy. So this is, this is the American costume. So back in the day, you know, especially in American society, Women always wore dresses and men wore pants. That was our distinction. In other cultures, you have um, women. There's actually a culture, I think it's an um, Asian culture, where women wear pants and men wear gowns. But you can see that there's a plain distinction. And both those garments are also modest. So in our society in America, women always wore dresses and skirts and um, this is American costume in the 1960s. And um, this is Mary Walker who came up with this dress. Back then women wore dresses down to the floor and um, they started to try to reform the dress and it's an outfit that consists of a dress, a cap, a vest, boots, coat or dress reaching from mid hot thigh to just below the knees. And there was a big controversy with this dress. And um, back in that day, it was very odd for women to wear a shorter dress. But um, while it would have been more practical for the dress not to be basically sweeping the floor, this dress just got shorter and shorter and started to look more and more masculine over time. So there was agenda behind that as well. So... Plain distinction. I saw that God's order has been reversed and his special directions disregarded by those who adopt the American costume. I was referred to Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. God would not have his people adopt the so-called reformed dress. It is immodest apparel, wholly unfitted for the modest, humble followers of Christ.
the photos above are Dr. Mary Walker. She started out wearing the regular American costume, which looked pretty, you know, not not as manly. <laughs> and um, but because increasing that it became increasingly masculine in her attire, she was also she was proud that she was arrested several times for impersonating a man. <laughs> she, um, she had taken uh, to fully wearing men's clothing from the top hat, wig, collar, and bow tie to the pants and shoes. So this is her, you know, going down. She looks like a, a young boy there. <laughs> so she just completely went to wearing men's clothing, starting from this American costume. So the hottest trends out of men's fashion week in Europe, guys in skirts. So, <laughs> oops, I went too far. So it says here in this article, why should we gals have all the fun with minis and maxis and pencils and A-lines? If the recent one way for the men's wear spring 2012 show in Europe are any indication you may soon have to fight your boyfriend for closet space to hang all of your skirts. <laughs> so as you can see, fashion is trying to just change things. As you can see here, these men wearing these very tight pants, you know, and looking very, it looks kind of feminine. <laughs> and, uh, you know, women wear the tight pants. This guy in the middle could look like a woman, you know, if he didn't have a beard. <laughs> so the fashions are just becoming more and more like neutral. So in kind of in between. And so you're not really sure if this is a woman's clothes or is this a man's clothes. It's just getting getting to be, you know, and this is a few years ago. Now it's even <laughs> it's even worse. <laughs> so they even have dresses for men. Look at this. So men wearing skirts and dresses. Why? What's the point of that? <laughs> and here we go again, some more men's dresses. This was Fashion Week in, in 2012. Yeah. So we're blurring the gender lines here. Here's Kanye wearing some skirts. <laughs> wow. And Vin and here he is wearing a skirt with the ladies. They're all dressed pretty much, pretty similar, you know? Anybody can put this on and we just, it's just universal, universal dress. And the Bible clearly states that a man shouldn't put on a woman's garment, neither a woman put on a man's garment. But now they're making skirts for men and they've made pants for women for some years now. And so obviously you can see that things are changing and there, there has been this underlying um, trend that you you don't see it at the beginning saying oh it's more practical to wear pants but then we have now we have men wearing skirts and you can't really tell the difference if we look at all the men and women just wearing t-shirts and jeans it's there's no distinction and God wanted it for us to have distinction in dress so that there is no confusion so There is an increasing tendency to have women in their dress and appearance as near like the other sex as possible and to fashion their dress very much like that of a man. But God pronounces it an abomination. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So as we're on our journey, 
to the promised land, <laughs> we have to recognize that God desires for us to have a mind towards heaven and he wants us to follow his laws and he has those laws in, in place for a reason. Um, so will we follow the world or will we follow God? You can see here, even the bathroom signs. <laughs> this is our distinction right here. We have men in pants and women in skirts. It just makes sense. This is our American culture, you know, to have that as our distinctive uh, dress. And all cultures have distinction in dress, you know, but now things are just changing um, so quickly. No education can be complete that does not teach right principles in regard to dress. Without such teachings, the work of education is too often retarded and perverted. You know, if you put one drop of poison in a glass of water, you're still not gonna drink it <laughs> because it's got poison in there and it's still gonna be bad for you. If you drink a glass of water with one drop of poison every day, it's gonna kill you. So it's the same with every principle that God put in place for us. If we're going to follow God, we should follow him in all aspects and not leave some behind because that quickly becomes a point of our stumbling and opens the door to more grievous things. So who is to blame? The idolatry of dress is a moral disease. It must not be taken over into new life. In most cases, submission to the gospel requirements will demand a decision, a decided change in, in the dress. True conversion of the heart will work wonderful changes in the outward appearance. If the heart is right, your words, your dress, your acts will be right as well. So God desires a change of heart and mind. And if we are transformed by God and we know and believe that God is leading us in every aspect of our lives, then we have to also conform to the other aspects of our spiritual walk with him, and that includes our dress. So what is the cross? The cross is our desires and God's desires merged together. So we, we would have to conform to his desires. And if we can go to Galatians 2, 20. Let me just pull it up here. Galatians 2, verse 20. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me, gave himself for me. And Romans 12, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of sacrifice holy and will of God so Christ our sacrifice he gave all for us he gave his life, he suffered, and he died on the cross for us. And God gave us his word. He gave us our word, his word, and he's very clear in his word about how we should live our lives. And he cares about every aspect of it, even our dress. He cares about everything because he knows how he made us. He knows what he made us to do. And he doesn't want us to be distracted by the enemy. And he gave us his son so that we can be free from the enemy's snares. 
We are never called upon to make a real sacrifice ourselves. We are never called upon to make a real sacrifice for God. Many things he asks us to yield to him, but in doing this, we are but giving up that which hinders us in the heavenward way. So the sacrifices that we think that we're making are not really sacrifices. They're blocks in our path that he's trying to remove so that we are not hindered in the heavenward way. So the true garment that God wants to give us, a change of raiment. In Luke 8, Luke 8, verse 27 and 35. It says, And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tomb. So this man, he had demons and he, he was naked, completely naked and he lived in the tomb. And verse 35 says, when they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed, in his right mind and they were afraid. So from verse 27, it shows this man who was naked and he had demons and demon cast, um, Jesus cast those demons out of him. And he was now clothed at sitting at the feet of Jesus in his right mind. So we can see that nakedness is in the Bible is not something that is good. And we know that it doesn't come from God. And when this man was in his right mind now, he was fully clothed.